Hello, hello, and welcome, Harvest Time Church. Welcome here. Good morning. Uh, beautiful day today. Happy to have you here. If you are new, please stop by the VIP booth and grab a gift. We are happy to have you here. Yes. And so today is a special day. Yes, we, we love coming and worshiping Jesus, but also it's a very special day. On top of what we're going to be doing is that it's Alyssa's birthday today. She turns 22, just like the Taylor Swift song. <laughs> And so nothing says birthday like a birthday donut that's jelly filled. And so if you would, would you join me? We're going to sing Alyssa a happy birthday because this is what she wanted. She said that <laughs> she will not continue if we do not sing happy birthday. And so on the count of three, so three, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Alyssa. Happy birthday to you. Hey, she Thank did it. Thank you, First guys. Try. I was shaking the whole time. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And so hopefully the fire alarm won't go off. Anyway, um, so in just a moment, Dave and Jessica are going to lead us in vocal worship. Then um, past, uh, we have a very special guest with us. I'm just going to share about a ministry that they're that, that they're a part of and doing. And then and lastly, Pastor's going to give a message. So it's going to be a great Sunday. If you're able to, would you please stand? And so would, just as a sign of, of just volunteering, just like oftentimes at school, if somebody asks, if a teacher asks a question, you, you put your hand up volunteering and say, I know. And so today we're just volunteering. Jesus, I'm, I'm volunteering whatever you have for me. I want it. I want you, Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you that today, Jesus, we desire you. Today, Jesus, we're making our stand. We're drawing the line in the sand saying no more. That, Lord, the first and foremost thing is you, Jesus. And so today, God, we are desperate for you. That today, God, as we vocally declare and praise you for who you are, Lord, I thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people, that you are here, that the mystery of God is here. And so, Lord, we don't take that for granted. That's a big thing. And so this morning, Jesus, would you meet with your people in a special way in your wonderful name. Amen.
thank you that we have hope in you because we know Jesus. God, I thank you that we have a hope in our salvation, that we know what is to come and that you, that you are good. God, we thank you that you are good and that you don't change, that you are always good. God, we are so thankful that we get to come here and worship you together as a, as a body. There is nothing more special than being in your presence with the other saints, singing shoulder to shoulder, regardless of if we've had a good week or a bad week. God, we can sing about how good you are. We can sing about your mercy. We can sing about your love. We can know that you never change and that you are our firm foundation. So God, I pray that this morning, it will be an encouragement to us, but also really more importantly, God, that our hearts will be so very focused on you that it will bring glory to your name, that it won't be focused on us because we're not the object of praise, but you are. So God, I pray that you will turn our eyes and turn our minds and turn our hearts to you. God, that we will know you so, so deeply and that we won't be satisfied with just singing words, but God, that it will come from the depths of our souls because you are worthy. Jesus, you are worthy.
the cross still stands, the blood still flows, the work is finished, and hell still knows that the grave is still is a 
faithful kind of love Everlasting Everlasting Father Prince of Peace Emmanuel God with us You're here with me Wonderful Counselor The government is resting on Desperation can cause you to do things that um, you know, would normally have do no, under a, a normal circumstance. But when you're desperate, you'll do whatever it takes. And that's exactly what we see modeled in the life of Jesus is when he came to earth. That's a, the desperate, that desperate act to redeem humanity. And so that's really the heartbeat of why we bring our tithes and offerings. It's a desperate act of how can we partner with what God's already doing to redeem broken, hurting people so they can be in a community that brings hope and healing and love and life. Because that's ultimately what the church is, and that's ultimately what God's plan is, is to bring people into this. And so on Tuesday night, there was a young man who had had an ACL surgery that morning, and I texted him because he had told me the week before, he goes, I'm gonna be at Young Adults. And I go, I don't know if that's wise. Um, but he, I texted him and I said, hey, you probably shouldn't come <laughs> to one of those moments because you just had surgery. He goes, no, I'm going to be there because I want to be, I, I can't miss. And so, and that's really, the, the I believe, our heartbeat at Harvest Time is that we want to be desperate for his presence and desperate to be in community and in his, in his community, amen? And so I just want to say a Pray a, pray a prayer and a blessing on you as you bring your tithe and offering this morning. And so, Jesus, I thank you that as we prepare that this morning, Lord, our heart posture is one of desperation. Desperation that the lost will be found, that dead hearts will be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, God, we are about that. We are about bringing people into this kind of community, a community of hope, love, and life because that's what we've experienced because of you, Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you that as we bring that to you, God, that is our prayer. And, Lord, we are desperate to see that in our day. In your wonderful name, amen. There's baskets on the side and in the back. And let's just continue to praise and worship our God for his names because his name is a powerful to save. It is powerful to heal, to redeem. And so we're going to continue to sing those this morning.
he shared what's going on in Haiti. A uh, million pictures going through my mind of Cuba and what's going on there. I'll be able to share them as we go on. And then last night, uh, the attack against Israel, middle of the night. Uh, I believe it's Psalm 121 that says, the one that watches over Israel will never slumber or sleep. Praise God for that. <laughs> then we'll do that. So many things going on. Habakkuk is where we want to pray this morning. Look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. People, if, what he's basically saying there, if he sat down and told us what he was doing, we still wouldn't believe it. So there is something going on. So what is our response? Habakkuk goes on and says, what good are idols carved by man, cast images that deceive you? So we don't have the idols or cast images, but we still are always looking to other things for knowledge and wisdom. And it says this, we cry out, teach us, rise up, help us. But this is God's response. Don't look to them for solutions. I am in the holy temple. Just be silent before me. He will guide us. He will show us what to do in these days. But there's a time just to be silent before him. So whatever area you want to pray, whatever area you want to think about and do it, we're just going to be silent for a moment. And then I'm going to come back and lead us in prayer. So let's just practice that for a moment. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, you're here. Resting on your 
We are your people. We are your people. And we stand in awe of our God this morning. We stand in awe of our God this morning that we have the right to come into his presence. Thank you, Lord. Your name, one more time. Your name, say. to pray for Israel again at the end of the service. I'll explain a little bit more of that as we go along, but this morning, welcome to Harvest Time. We are glad you're here. My name is Pastor Kim, and you are at the Eau Claire campus of Harvest Time. There's other campuses across the valley, and we are so glad you joined us. Thank you for joining us online. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to go offline just for a little bit here, about the next 10 minutes. Uh, we have some global workers with us, 
and we have to be careful what they are able to see. So there'll be a slide where you can do, uh, join us in about 10 minutes, go get some more cereal or whatever is going on. <laughs> we appreciate that. So we will be back with that. Thank you. Uh, I was in Cuba the last week, and they actually told me not to even talk about that.
First off, welcome back online. It's amazing society we live in that we have to do that nowadays, but thank you for being patient with us. Hey, people, we've got an incredible week happening at harvest time. It actually is starting this afternoon. Uh, we have a ready team, which is a team that goes out to disaster relief. They're doing chainsaw training this afternoon. And if you want to do that or find more information, there is a table back there. And my wife will never let me get within seven feet of a chainsaw. I don't understand, but that's it. But she is here. This is my lovely, that beautiful wife, yeah, Jenny. Yeah. No, I, I am here to <laughs> highly encourage and hopefully, prayerfully motivate all the women in this church to sign up for our women's event that's coming up this Saturday, April 20th. It's from 8 to 9, social hour. There, you'll be... 3.30-ish is the end date, but honestly, we are having our wonderful children's pastor, Pastor Allison, who is a wonderful communicator, a lover of Jesus, uh, amazing woman of God, and her older sister, who spoke here a few years ago, and people still remember uh, Pastor Hillary Furnish speaking. So it is going to be an awesome time, and it's more than just a conference. Nobody wants to go to those. We don't. But honestly, every time we have them, there's a time of connection. Uh, we just feel the presence of the Lord, and I love the theme this year. It's return, based on the verse in Jeremiah, returning to him with all our heart. And in these days, that's what we need. So please, ladies, if you haven't signed up, we'd love you to come. Nobody's a stranger there. It's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you. And then lastly, this Wednesday night, uh, there's an incredible movie. It's uh, about an hour long, uh, Letters to the American Church. And it's by a book by Eric Metaxas. And it's about, it's a, it's a challenge. How, how do we be the church in these days? It's exploring, you know, the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, under Nazi Germany. And it, it, it will be a time. I would highly encourage, first off, you to come, but to bring somebody with you. Like I said, it's an hour long, and it's at 6.30 this Wednesday, and there's no reason we should not fill up this auditorium with this movie. So you'll get, be getting other information through text messages. Sign up for our texting if you don't have that yet. I want to just share a thought with you from Malachi. Book of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. The next th three weeks, this week and three weeks after, I, it's actually going to be a prophetic series. I don't do prophetic series because, in all honesty, I don't know what's coming up in the future. I have made projections, and so far I'm 0 for. I've never been right yet, and I hope the series is more prophetic than pathetic, but we'll still try, you know, in that way. But I, th th this was laid on my heart for us, uh, just a kind of an insight of what's happening, and it's out of Malachi. These are the very last words of the very last prophet, and after these words were said, there were no prophetic words, per se, for almost 400 years before John the Baptist started to speak. So this is the last words for 400 years. You go 400 years, that is our whole country from the Mayflower till today. Just nothing would happen. That, that's quite a time period. And this is what it says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I'll come and strike the land with a curse. Okay? Uh, the spirit of Elijah is what we're going to be looking at the next few weeks. This is also spoken of in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, where it says this. Look, I'm sending my messenger, verse 1. I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you are looking for so eagerly is coming, saying, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So it's saying that the Lord himself is going to suddenly come to the temple and then the messenger before the great and terrible day of the Lord. 
I honestly believe that when there's prophetic words in the Bible, they are for a specific time, but I don't believe that they end. Most of them do not end. They speak to our time, and then they will culminate uh, to another time. And by saying that, the way Jesus described prophetic words is like labor pains, that labor pains start and you know a baby's coming, but then labor pains continue until they get so intense right before the birth. And so I believe that these things are secular and they continue to happen in intensity. Uh, one example of that would be the Bible talks about an antichrist, that there will be an antichrist. But uh, Peter says there's a spirit, or John, excuse me, said there's a spirit of antichrist in the world. So I believe there are antichrists that have risen up throughout history. Anti basically means instead of Christ. There's people that have ri risen up instead of Christ. But how many know it's going to cultivate in one person that will be the ultimate instead of Christ? So it happened, it continues to happen, and eventually will happen in an intense way. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. So the Bible says there will be a, a spirit of Elijah that will come upon before the great and dreadful day. And then it also says the Lord himself, then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. How many know Mary and Joseph just one day just brought Jesus to the temple? Simeon saw it. <laughs> Anna saw it. They just came. Uh, he came numerous times during the feast. He celebrated the feast. We don't have that all written in the Bible, but I, I guarantee that the three feasts, he was always there for Passover, always there for Pentecost, and always there for the Feast of Tabernacles. He was there at all those. So he visited. When he was 12 years old, he was in the temple. His parents were looking for him. They misplaced him, and they would travel the way. I can't imagine what that would feel like in a way I do, because there was a time we were in a store. I Was it Walmart, hon, that our daughter disappeared? It was what? Pennies. pennies. Just like I said, pennies. I remember it clearly, pennies. <laughs> it's just another way of spelling Walmart. <laughs> We were in pennies, and she disappeared, and we talked to them. They did a code. They shut down every door. We were looking everywhere, and I'm running around. Where's my daughter? And you, the little circle things where they put clothes on and hang them on hangers, and I walked by one, and I heard this little voice, hi, Dad. <laughs> and I looked in there. I go, what are you doing in here? This is my fort. I go, why wouldn't you climb in there and do a fort and having to clear that, that was about three and a half minutes. I can't imagine being a day out of town and then having to race back to Jerusalem. Where's our 12-year-old? Okay, you that have 12-year-olds know that you could release them to Milwaukee and nothing would happen. Let them be there a day. But he was there in the temple, wasn't he? Teaching. He came to the temple on what we call Holy Week and flipped the tables and said, you've made it a den of thieves. And the Bible promises he will quickly come to the temple. So Jesus did fulfill those things happening. But then it says this. It says this interesting thing. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay? The great and dreadful. People, when the Bible puts those two words together, great and dreadful, it's talking about return of Messiah. When it talks about great and dreadful, and... I don't have time to read all the Bible verses to you. Uh, the notes are on our app. Please download the app. But I'll just, I'm going to read the Bible verses. There's no way you'll have time to do this. Uh, I will tell you this. If you're ever writing Bible verses really fast, write the reference first because it's harder to remember the numbers. You remember the book easier. Write the numbers and then go back and write the book. I learned that at Bible college when the professors would give you 800 verses and you're trying to write them down. And I wrote as many as I could, but I'm a B student too. <laughs> Didn't quite get them all. But look at Isaiah 13, 9 and 10. The terrible day, the great and dreadful, dreadful, this is dreadful. The dreadful day when his fierce anger comes, when the heavens will no longer give light. Amos 5, 18. Don't desire it. It's a time of darkness, not light. Obadiah 1.15, your deeds will return on your head on that day. 
Matthew 24, 21. It will be a time of tribulation like never before. Now, how many realize none of that happened when Jesus walked the earth? None of that happened. Okay? But how many know it was a great time when he walked the earth? Isaiah 12, 4 says, there will be those who will exalt his name and give him praise. Isaiah 4, 2, at that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful. And Isaiah 2, 17, the Lord himself will be exalted on that day. So it will be a great and dreadful day of the Lord. Great for those who have relationship with Adonai. And dreadful for those that don't. <laughs> They're going to want the rocks to fall on them. So the Bible says there is a great and dreadful day coming. A great and dreadful day coming when he's going to set his kingdom up. And it promises, back to Malachi 4, that when that happens, the spirit of Elijah will come to the people. Okay? As I said, these are prophetic messages and... When you talk about prophetic and prophecy, and there are so many prophets out there explaining what's going to happen, um, in fact, I'm surprised we're all here. Wasn't the eclipse supposed to do something or something like that? I don't know. We can be wrong a lot in prophetic messages, but I think sometimes we get it wrong what prophetic messages are for. People, I don't necessarily find prophetic messages telling us exactly what's going to happen next Tuesday. But I do find that when something happens Tuesday, we can trust, oh, God talked about that. And we can trust him as things unfold. So the idea of prophetic messages are not necessarily to tell us the future. It's to tell us when the future starts to unfold, you can trust me because I said this would happen. And it will make sense. How many know looking back is always easier? Right? Come on, parents. <laughs> How many know it's easier to parent your kids when your grandparents and wish you would have done things different, right? I like what my mother said to me once. She said, well, you'd do all different things if you had it to do over, but then you just make a whole lot more regrets about that too. So guess what? We're going to make mistakes, right? It's always easier to understand looking back. And so people be encouraged when it comes to prophetic words. Jesus said this in John 16, 4, I have told you these things, so when they happen, you'll remember my warning. I've told you these things. Not that we're going to know when they're going to happen, but when they happen, we will know. That's a difference. How many know that's a difference? He didn't tell us these things, so we know when they're going to happen, but when they do happen, we'll remember and know, oh, you told us this was going to happen. Okay? And so there is this great and dreadful day of the Lord coming. And what's going to happen? The spirit of Elijah is going to happen. I have not been able to leave this story of the transfiguration. I just keep going to it, and every time I go to it, there's some more knowledge that comes to me and another thing I never saw. And so what happened is Jesus went up this mountain. He began to pray. He began to shine like the sun. Then Moses and Elijah appeared with him. And the three of them are having a conversation. Peter, James, and John are kind of awed by that. I would have to admit, if I'm walking behind someone and they start to glow like the sun, that would be an awe experience in my life. The hardest thing that they probably had to deal with is when they were walking down the mountain, Jesus said, don't tell anybody what you just saw. How do you go to the other nine disciples? What did you guys do up there? Nothing. <laughs> How do you do that? How many know sometimes Jesus just lifted the devil? I mean, he rose people from the dead, and he healed blind people and said, don't tell anybody. Didn't you used to be blind? Maybe. <laughs> Weren't you dead? Possibly. <laughs> how, do you, how do you obey that? I don't know how to obey some of that. I'm shining like the sun. Don't tell anybody. The Bible says the very next thing they did is they argued about who was best. How are Peter, James, and John saying, we know something you don't know? <laughs> what do you know? Can't tell you. You have to ask Jesus, but he told us not to tell you. And I'm like, anyway, he starts to radiate the glory of God. 
Elijah appears. Elijah appears. What did Malachi say? Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Elijah is appearing. Why do you think Peter, James, and John thought this is it? The kingdom has come. Our God is starting to radiate. He's starting to glow. There's Elijah. He's standing with him. This is the end. This is the kingdom of God coming. This is what we've been waiting for. And then Elijah disappears. And Peter and James and John and Jesus start walking down. There was confusion in their life. Well, how do I know that? Because John chapter se- or excuse me, John Matthew chapter 17 verse 10 says the disciples asked him, "Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before Messiah comes?" That's a good question. You know what they're really asking? Elijah was here. You are glowing. The kingdom of God is here. Why did he disappear? He was here. I mean, it was falling into place. Exactly what we've been expecting. We have been following you for this day. This was it. You should have walked down that hill with Elijah right next to you, according to what Malachi said was supposed to happen. You two should have walked down glowing. You could have looked at Rome. They would have melted in fear. The kingdom of Israel would have been raised up. This was it. Why did he disappear? Do you understand the question? It's kind of like the way they deflected it. Why do those people say Elijah? Because <laughs> they didn't want to seem ignorant on their own. Why do those people say Elijah should come? <laughs> Aren't you asking that too? Well, yeah, he was here. I don't understand. It looked like everything was going. <laughs> it looked like the prophecy was happening, and it just kind of fell apart. Uh, look at Jesus' response. In verse 12, but I tell you, Elijah has already come, but he wasn't recognized, and they chose to abuse him. In the same way, they're also going to make the Son of Man suffer. Then his disciples realized he was talking about John the Baptist. Okay? They understood he was talking about John the Baptist. It wasn't a lot of answer to their question of why isn't the kingdom of God happening, but they did understand John the Baptist. People, Jesus is not saying that John the Baptist was a reincarnated Elijah. I, I've heard these teachings out there. John the Baptist was Elijah. How do we know it wasn't Elijah? Because Elijah didn't die. He went right up to heaven. John was born, miraculously born, but born. So Elijah couldn't come back down and be born. He never died. He, he can't be reincarnated if you're not dead. Okay, he wasn't that. John died before Elijah appeared on that mountain. They say, well, isn't Elijah and John the same people? They knew John. So if he was John and he appeared there, how many think the disciples would have recognized him? John. They went to call him Elijah, would they? It's John. I know John. We talked to John. Some of them were disciples of John before that. And they didn't call him John. So Elijah was not John. In fact, John said in John 1.21 said, I'm not Elijah. <laughs> he said, I'm not him. They said, are you Elijah? No, I'm not, okay? But Luke 1.17 says, John will move in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. So what they're saying is that the ministry that John does will be like the ministry Elijah did. And the reason his ministry is doing that is to prepare the way of the Lord. So John was not Elijah, but he admits, I'm moving in the same spirit as Elijah did to prepare the way of the Lord. Okay? Now, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We said that's not the first coming of the Lord. We're talking about the second return of Messiah. And what we're going to explore the next three weeks is if the spirit of Elijah had to come upon John, 
to prepare for the first coming of Messiah. I believe the spirit of Elijah is going to come upon his church to prepare for the second coming of Messiah before the great and dreadful coming of Messiah, that we are called as a church to prepare the way of Messiah. And so what we're going to look at is three areas. We're going to look at characteristics in John and Elijah that I believe are being birthed in the church today. One is we're going to talk about his clothing of all things, that we're going to have to be careful what we wear. No, I'm kidding. That's not what I'm... <laughs> but <laughs> there's something about the clothing. There's something about the wilderness, because they are both prophets of the wilderness. And then bo both of them had a voice, that God's going to give us a voice. He's going to bring us through the wilderness. And we're going to walk with the clothing which actually the clothing means the word glory. The clothing they wore literally meant glory. They were clothed in the glory of God wherever they went. Those three characteristics before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, why do I think this is important right now? And I leave you with this thought. Why do I believe it's important? It says, when the prophet Elijah comes, I'm gonna read it to you again, verse five, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I explained that's the return of Messiah. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, that always confused me because Jesus' ministry, it says here in Malachi, he'll make the fathers return to the hearts of the children and the children to the fathers, right? That's pretty plain. It says that, right? How many know when Jesus was walking, there were conflicts, and he said this, do not think I have come to bring peace, but I've come to bring a sword. And what does he say? Fathers are gonna turn against children and children against parents. He says that, doesn't he? How can the Messiah return the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. And then Jesus come and say, I've come to bring a sword that fathers and children split. That's confusing. I'm 63. That was confusing for years. It keeps me up at night. These kind of things keep you up at night. And I know all of you are the same as me. Then it dawned on me, I was listening to this teacher in my office and he just shared it. And anybody that's been in my office knows that there are these times I'll be in my office with the door closed. And when I get these revelations, I just come walking out. I kind of look odd. And then I walk in here and walk around praying. In fact, Alyssa said numerous times, you must, she stopped me. You got to tell me what you just learned. <laughs> she knows the look all right. I'm like, are you kidding me? And I go walking away. Well, this one was confirmed with some uh, Jewish people that I know. The father's people. When the Bible says the fathers, it's not talking dad. When the Bible teaches the fathers, I discovered this. Look throughout the Old Testament. Whenever it says the fathers, it says Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the children are not the natural kids of Abraham. Jesus said that. Paul said that. Don't think just because you're born from Abraham have the same relationship. He said, those that believe in Adonai are true children of Abraham. True children of Abraham, those that believe in Adonai. Who are the children? Come on, help me out. Who are the children? Grafted into Abraham. Oh, the people that are born Jewish, what a blessing they have. Everything we have is from them. Praise God. Praise God. We wouldn't have this without them. We're grafted in. We're wild. We're wild branches. Grafted in. But it says in the last days, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people, are going to unite with the Gentile children. And the Gentile children are going to have a heart back for Judaism. We're going to begin to love Israel one more time.
That is the key of the spirit of Elijah coming back upon the people. People, now, just one, one more quick thing. When I say spirit of Elijah, I don't think there's a spirit. Of, I, I believe it's Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm not praying for an Elijah spirit. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, do this. Return us back to a heart of Israel. <laughs> and return Israel back to a heart for Christianity. I was reading a book. Uh, uh, it was an autobiography by Netanyahu. It was written uh, two years ago. It's a fairly new book, his autobiography. And in that autobiography, he said something near the end. He said, I am amazed at the support Christianity has for Israel. <laughs> he, he's discovering that. He said, my whole life, I haven't, I don't know his age. I believe he's in his 70s. <laughs> he said, my whole life, I haven't noticed it. But he said, these last few years, the heart of Christianity for Israel. <laughs> he's amazed. What's the Bible say? Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the church is going to honor its fathers. The church is going to honor its fathers. So expect these things that we're going to talk on the next three weeks to be building up in our lives. Because we're seeing that one. How many know if we're seeing that one? The others have to follow. The others have to follow. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Here's how I want to close. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray, God, turn our hearts back to you. What you love, we love. What you're concerned about, we're concerned about. God, stir it up in our hearts. We're going to ask Holy Spirit to come on our lives. Holy Spirit, fill us. Turn our hearts to you. We're going to pray for Israel for a moment. We did already, but God, give them wisdom what to do. These are incredible days. God, turn them to you. If you're at home, face east, wherever you are, face east, face toward Jerusalem and pray these things. I would like to invite as many people that want to come forward. We're just going to gather. We're going to ask, Holy Spirit, fill us. May the spirit of Elijah come upon us to be your church. I'm going to ask someone, can they just bring our Israeli flag and put it here somewhere? Can someone carry that over? We're going to gather around the Israeli flag. We're just going to pray that God would do that work in our day. God, do that work in our day. Just may that one come forward. We're just going to wait on him just for a moment. I'll give you a blessing in just a moment. Let's just do this. God, do this in our day. Do this in our day. God, we're asking that that would happen. I'll turn it back over to the worship team. We'll come back in just a moment and pray.
up to the mountains? Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. Just one more time and I'll give you a blessing. speak over you now. The Lord himself will bless you and keep you. He will make his face shine over you and be gracious to you. He will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the presence, power, and love of Jesus Christ. God bless you, church. Thank you so much for joining us online today. Whether you consistently watch us online or you're just out of town, we really appreciate you being a part of our service today. I'd like just to encourage you with a couple of things. Number one is if you need prayer, we'd like to pray with you. We join as a staff each week and pray over the needs of our church and our congregation. And if you could let us know what your prayer requests are, you can just put one in the comments below but if it's something that you'd like to keep private, you can email us that at office.ec at htcfamily.org. And that's a way that we can do that because we'd love to connect with you. You are not walking this out alone. Another thing that we'd like you to do is be aware that we give out these Fresh Start books and Bibles. If you would like either one of those, please contact us and we will mail those to you so that you can be a part of what we're giving out to our in-person congregation. And lastly, I would encourage you to download our app, whether you're on Google Play or the App Store. It's an incredible, informative thing. It has sermon notes in there. It has old sermons. We always have a Bible verse that we say together. That's where that Bible verse is found. And also your giving can be done right through the app. Again, thank you for joining us. We are so grateful for you. I speak God's blessing over your life. Have an incredible day.